Welcome to uh, Silicon Valley Energy Summit, and this is our session on using IoT tools to make buildings more energy efficient while maintaining cybersecurity. And, and really the topic that came up, uh, I'm a member of the planning committee, and really that process entails us throwing out a, a, a whole host of topics that we were considering to include in this year's Energy Summit. And uh, a couple of uh, sort of criteria that we apply is, is it really something actionable? Can the information be taken home and applied in your respective organizations? The other is really, is it a contemporary subject? And I think, you know, Internet of Things is, is sort of a, the topic du jour, if you will, because it is being discussed. Almost everything you read has some reference to Internet of Things. I think there's many definitions, and a lot of people perhaps see it differently than uh, many enterprise organizations are at least approaching it. Uh, because this is an energy conference, we're trying to apply Internet of Things uh, in, in really built environments and how it could improve energy efficiency. So that resonated with the planning committee, and, and since I brought up the topic, I, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, so I got the responsibility to organize the committee, uh, of which we've got some very great presenters for you today. Uh, starting with Aaron Lapsley, and Aaron is the program manager for smart buildings at Cushman Wakefield at the Google campus. And Aaron's got a long history in smart buildings. Previously, he was the president of, uh, I forgot the name of that firm. Switch Automation. Switch Automation, uh, as well as a long history in the mechanical engineering background. Uh, he has a PE license in over three states in the U.S. and really understands uh, building automation. We have Rod, uh, Ravi Jadva, Jadhav, and Ravi's a product manager at Cisco, and I think Cisco is one of the leading companies in really building uh, digital building automation. They provide a really rich set of solutions, uh, kind of had been in the forefront of this, but I think uh, really tying in all of the automation with analytics with qualified partners that you go to the market with a really complete solution and Ravi will cover some of that. And then, you know, there's a real, I think, big challenge in particular in the enterprise. I and, mean, you know, everyone may have a, an Alexa at home or a Google and internet security in your own homes may not be a top priority, but within almost every organization and enterprise, uh, security is really on the board's agenda, and at least at my company at NetApp, we, you know, we are required to report on our progress with uh, cybersecurity, and we've got a pretty large team uh, addressing with that. And quite honestly, as a consequence, every day we seem to be restricted, or there's multiple authentication processes, multi-factor authentication requirements for us, and then segmentation of networks, and, and we're finding it becoming, you know, um, perhaps some barriers to some people in the company would argue about impacting their productivity. And there's a, a balanced equation. And then you introduce uh, the whole world of Internet of Things, and I could imagine every CISO out there having this real big concern about what kind of vulnerabilities and risks that introduces to the enterprise network. So with that, we have uh, Jeff Clavin. He's the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer at SRI International. And Jeff has a, a deep background in in this particular space, but also understands the general corporate environment being at companies like Applied Materials and Accenture and Sandisk and a whole other host of Silicon Valley type companies. Uh, Jeff will bring in the, really the discussion of how you intersect cybersecurity with developing an implementation plan uh, for Internet of Things. And, and we're really more focused in on the uh, building automation side. So with that, uh, really kind of want to open up the session, and we've got a few presentations. The agenda's before you. 
and we'll really kind of go from uh, just level setting with presentations to a moderated discussion to audience Q&A. And, and again, I, I don't think we want to be really structured, so if a question pops in your mind, feel free to ask it, uh, because it's better to put it in the context if something uh, comes to mind as the presenter has a slide up. Uh, by all means, ask the question, and we don't have to defer that to the end. So with that, uh, Aaron, please. Yeah, I think I did. Right. But I am. You have minimized um, that. Yours should be up. Okay. Good. Okay. Hi, I'm Aaron. Thanks for uh, taking a few minutes here to, to listen to me talk a little bit. Uh, about energy efficiency in IoT. So I'm going to kick us off. I'll probably be a little bit high level. Um, as Ralph mentioned, I'm, I'm an engineer. I spent some time as a management consultant. Uh, and as, uh, as of the last six years or so, I've really made a conscious effort to focus on sort of the convergence of uh, building operations and technology and data and how we can develop programs to actually implement um, data-driven operational solutions. And so I've worked with a lot of commercial and corporate real estate clients as a, as a consultant. Um, I worked for about three years with a, with a startup, uh, as mentioned, and uh, built and ran um, Switch Automation's professional services team that worked with uh, real estate portfolios to develop and deploy smart building programs. Um, so, you know, I feel really at home at this conference. This is a, a good place for me, and I'm, I'm um, pretty excited to talk today. Um, kicking this off, most people in the room probably are familiar with these slides. These are clipped straight off EIA. Um, I, I like to point out that, you know, despite what a lot of the headline, uh, you know, the ratio of headlines might suggest, most of the energy in the United States and really across the world is consumed by things that don't move around. Um, so it's consistently been about 40% for the combination of residential and commercial buildings. I think in the last year it's down to about 18% for commercial. Um, I'd happily see industrial take up a bigger percentage of that pie if the whole pie got a lot smaller. I think it makes sense that we use a lot of energy in energy intensive areas and we use way too much in commercial and, and residential properties. And I've sort of spent these last six years um, learning that story over and over again about how much better buildings really could be. So um, the good news is we, we know what to do to use less energy in buildings. It's not that complicated. You focus on the stuff that uses the most energy. In commercial buildings, about half of energy is consumed by HVAC and another quarter by lighting. The vast majority of energy efficiency savings from lighting are going to come with and are coming from LED retrofits. So about 85% of the savings typically come from, from the LED retrofit itself and the remaining from smarter controls. So really the sort of addressable part here for IoT that is still emerging is, is the HVAC side. That's the biggest area of impact. Um, there was this New York Times uh, quiz last summer that was really interesting and they gave you four options. It was on the headline page. It said, what is going to have the biggest impact on global uh, climate change? And it was eating less meat, adopting more wind farms, um, uh, adopting more public transportation, or uh, making H uh, air conditioning specifically better. And the answer was air conditioning. And then there was a quote right below that when, you, you know, if you got the quiz right or wrong, that was there in the box. Air conditioning is not exciting to most people, but I like to remind people, even beyond energy efficiency, refrigerants themselves are highly potent greenhouse gases. And essentially every molecule of refrigerant is going into the, that's ever manufactured has gone into the atmosphere. There's a very small amount in very large industrial refrigeration plants that's reclaimed mostly because of health and safety reasons, but you can essentially assume that every molecule of refrigerant is going into the atmosphere. So we're spending energy to make refrigerant that's going into the atmosphere that is, you know, R22 that's being sunsetted in 2020 is 1,500, di or 1500 times more potent um, than CO2. 
you know, methane that gets a lot of attention, you know, from sort of dairy cows or, or meat industry, it's only about 20 times more potent. So this is a big deal, and it's also massively being adopted. So we know what to focus on. We know how to run HVAC better. We know how to design better. We know how to operate better. Why doesn't it happen? Right? Should be fairly obvious. And this is really the reason why. Because if you look, this, this data is for office buildings in large cities in the U.S. Uh, from BOMA. But if you look at the actual budget for a building, um, utilities are typically in any given building about 5 to 10 percent, on average 7 percent of the total rental income for a building. So this is not the thing that moves the needle for the buildings. So for these last sort of six, seven years, I've had this recurring cycle in my head over and over from these slides. It's like, okay, huge opportunity. We know what to do, right? But there's not that much that anyone's really going to do about it because it's a small impact. And what I've started to learn, um, and one of the reasons I'm excited to now be at Cushman and Wakefield, um, I've kind of run the gamut of services you can do for real estate and engineering and consulting and uh, management consulting and technical consulting and a solution provider, and now I'm with a property manager. And I'm excited about that because the way that you get to address the energy bucket, the utilities bucket on that, is actually by taking that whole variable operating expense part and reducing those costs in every category. And companies like ours, like, like Cushman and Wakefield and, and you know, our uh, competitive set, are increasingly being asked by real estate portfolios, particularly amongst companies who that's not their core competency, corporations that do other things but have real estate assets, they're being asked to actually provide glide paths or reductions for all of these things. And so you can actually develop data-driven programs that really increase the operations of the buildings across the board in pretty much every category, and as a part of that, you get to address the energy piece of it, um, which is really the part that I always cared about. But there's a ton of interesting stuff going on in repair and maintenance, labor optimization, um, getting the right skill sets and the right roles. And what it comes down to is better management. So management is kind of boring, um, but you know, I have this side that went to Harvard Business School and got an MBA, and I, you know, I, I have to sort of recognize the fact that the thing that's been missing in buildings in particular is just proper management. There, there may be some disruptive technologies that come along and help here, but to be honest with you, it's the sort of boring, fix the air conditioning part, manage it better, that's really going to get us to shave 20 or 30 percent uh, off of that energy consumption. So what does that? Well, it's data and IoT. Sorry, you're on the slide because it's so hard to see those slides. With all the oh, yeah. Well, yeah I mean, uh, is there some way to prove it? We can't see the slide. Is there a way to cut lighting? Thank you. Sorry, since you're on the topic of cutting lighting and saving. <laughs> right, yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Don't turn up the air. <laughs> yeah. No, don't turn it up. Just stand away from them. Just run it right. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> the history of IoT. <laughs> yeah. uh, yay! We got a guy video us, so let's balance his requirements up. Okay, that kind of looks Perfect. No worries. The history of IoT really is, the, in its early stages, the history of building automation. The first things that actually, con, you know, controls that actually did stuff controlling things were the thermostat and industrial pneumatic controls. And that sort of ran the show for a hundred years. But the first actual data producing digi direct digital control system was a building automation system. It actually was deployed in the year I was born, 1981, in, in Melbourne, at the University of Melbourne. Um, and, um, and that's straight from the Wikipedia article on that. So the, um, the system itself is, you know, at sort of the beginning of Internet of Things, what it is is it's, it's a network set of direct digital controls that are passing data between devices and actually communicating, right? Now, there were other, you know, examples of computers controlling things before that, but sort of this definition of a network direct digital control system is really the genesis of IoT. Um, that has advanced a lot in the preceding 40 years, and now, you know, in this world where, you know, I, I sort of have a role in smart buildings, really what that is doing is shepherding the future of IoT into building operations. Um, and um, the things that we're really, really looking at are the four bullets under that 
upper rightmost box. Integrating systems of multiple types, normalizing the data into a common model, putting applications with decent user experience over the top of that so that people can do things with the data, and then deploying increasingly low-cost, flexible sensor applications so we can get new sources of data out. Great example being vibration monitoring. Something that everyone would have loved to have done, say, 10 years ago, but it was too expensive. Now it's something that we can do relatively inexpensively uh, because you don't need to bring out the building automation contractor to do it. There's companies that actually provide that as a solution. That's actually how you get predictive maintenance on, on any kind of rotating equipment is through looking at vibration analysis. So what does IoT mean in buildings? Um, it's a little bit complicated, but there's sort of two flavors of it, right? There's the people that are always going to say, we already do IoT, right? We've already done this. That is true. What the key is, is we're connecting that stuff now and putting the data into a useful place. And I always have to remind them, you, you aren't necessarily doing things with a data warehouse. Your data was always hard to get to or not being used or not being permanently stored. So there are sort of IoT or modern IT solutions that are helping the building automation side of this or metering side. But the new IoT application is really interesting. I break it into two categories that I've seen. Flexible sensoring, which is sort of, I, you know, at working for a solution provider, we want to be able to go put out cheap, flexible sensors and move them around as needed. Um, and innovative applications. Most of these are sold as vertically integrated software as a service solutions, but we've got one going in with a company um, that's a, a small startup that is doing, say, plant soil moisture monitoring. Um, out at the Google campus so that you can actually water and fertilize at the right times and keep plants from turning over and dying. Um, so innovative sort of domain-specific applications that are actually really high value. Um, all of this can sort of be lumped into a big framework for building technology. I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through this, but typically what's called smart buildings is really the BIoT or building IoT part of this. It's the data producing things. Again, some of that is core and you were going to have anyway. And then there the challenge is connecting that stuff. And then you've got these flex or innovative applications. There's also a lot of stuff going on in what Cushman is calling process automation. A lot of interesting stuff with robotics uh, in buildings, particularly related to security, cleaning, um, parking lot, exterior environments, maintenance. And those are always going to sort of be lumped into a smart buildings program, uh, semantically. But we like to think of those things differently because that's sort of automating business processes. Um, I don't know how fast and how far this is going to go. I've done probably 15 what I would call legitimate smart building programs with different customers. So real estate investment trusts, corporate real estate portfolios, uh, big commercial uh, you know, pension fund style long-term real estate asset investors. Um, this framework holds across any set of buildings or connected assets. Uh, the part where I am seeing the most lag in this is in the people in process. It is not that hard at this point, and it's actually reasonably economical to get the hardware out, get the data into a database, get it normalized. It's finding people that know how and what to do with it. That is consistently the challenge we run into. So, you know, I. Listening to Cheryl talk in the keynote, you know, about sort of di disruptive places that people might invest and all of the stuff in innovation, I sort of worry that we're missing the bar here or missing, missing the important piece in getting skill sets raised up. So if there's a startup that I wanted to start, it would actually be some sort of educational institution that would teach people that want to work in buildings how to work with data. And I just mean sort of basic skills around reading graphs and understanding, you know, time series data and charts and tables. Um, this isn't complex query writing or machine learning. We need people that can look at graphs and figure out how that means that this thing is broken and then send someone out to fix it. Um, and so I'm, I'm really hopeful that we're going to get there over time, uh, particularly as the younger generation comes up working on buildings. Um, and I think the rest of the folks are going to talk a lot, a lot more about sort of the security and the technical details of how that stuff gets plugged in. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll stop for there. Sure. I um, just wanted to see how I'll go about our commercial energy efficiency, um, working, uh, starting to work with existing building data centers and whatnot, sure. trying to be uh, sensors for uh, fall protection and uh, help us for energy efficiency projects. Absolutely. So, uh, the question is uh, uh, are you finding that um, people are, are uh, being uh, accepting of 
passive meter um, IoT on their devices for the universe. You said uh, you mentioned uh, vibration. We, we use it for uh, signature mapping. Sure. Uh, so you mean like behind the meter, as in within the within the four walls? Uh, yeah. That's the world that I live in, right? So I, I don't ever go outside of the meter. Okay, I, I, I live up to the meter. Right. Uh, as you say. But I'm, I'm working super hard to get in there um, and be a little more granular. So the question is, am I seeing this being adopted? The answer is yes, absolutely. Particularly the connected buildings part of this. This bit right here, that box, that is starting to become increasingly common. This is stuff you already have in place and just getting the data into a normalized area. So every program I've ever worked on has involved some element of that. Um, adding new sensors, still very dependent on the appetite for investment. I'm lucky enough to have a client in Google right now, and part of the reason I went to take the engagement I did is because you know, their portfolio is growing, they care about their, their people's productivity, they care about their real estate assets a lot. Um, I've never had a client that wanted to, to, to invest as much in this space before. So there's a lot of people where everything is still low bid, low cost. And, and sort of innovative solutions they push off to service providers. But yeah, I mean, I think increasingly this is adopt across the board being adopted. It's still early stage, though, on innovative stuff. On the software side, to do this bit here, you know, getting fairly advanced. Yeah. Uh, yeah, through one city and uh, consulting years, a little bit of work. Uh, I did a lot of work in India, and um, there's three companies that dominate the uh, management and, and, and um, the leasing uh, transaction right. for commercial buildings that would be JLL, CBRE, and Cushman. Right. Cushman and JLL and CBRE, I think, could play a huge role in transforming buildings very easily. I totally agree with that, by the way. I think they're probably the biggest barrier to energy efficiency. I also agree with that. <laughs> that I, I'm only three months on Cushman, right? So I'm not totally native yet. But, but this is a, a well-recognized problem, right? That, yeah, in the, in the RFPs that are written by this company, there's no incentive whatsoever for developers to do anything in energy efficient around air conditioning. In fact, the requirements are set, written in such a way that the developers have to massively oversize air conditioning. Sure. That's a problem of the consulting industry too, though, right? <laughs> well, and what won't get them sued? I mean, I used to be a consulting engineer, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the developers I'm working with are dying to reduce the cost of the buildings by not having the oversight because the are of these companies. So, sure. if you do get a chance in the future to help make a really big difference, I think it's. The biggest thing is this transaction that is standing in the way of being able to make the most of the largest air conditioning market on the planet more efficient. So I really Interesting. Is so that particularly bad in India? Is that what you're saying? In India, it's particularly bad. Interesting. I mean, look, there, there's a raft of problems in this. I have a slide that I didn't, you know, I, I it could be 20 minutes. We just actually expand that discussion. I'd actually like to bring Ravi up because yeah. there is other requirements that get driven out of that. And then, Peter, your point is very valid. A, a extremely complex set of problems. And, and I agree with you. The, the property managers play a huge role there. Let's talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Those were great insights. Oops. All right. Uh, apart from struggling with PowerPoints, I am a product manager at Cisco. My name is Ravi Chadav and I focus on enterprise IoT. Now, uh, what that really means uh, is I focus on solutions uh, that help our customers digitize some of their most important assets, and that's buildings. 
Now, Aaron briefly touched upon uh, the transition from OT to IT. And what that really means is uh, there has to be some kind of a mechanism that's used underlying for these OT components, let's say anything in a building, a light, an HVAC, a sensor, so that they can talk to each other. And that's what makes the building really smart. Now, I just wanted to bring this picture up and show the buildings of yesterday they were pretty simple. You would have an IP network, you would have a phone DBX system, uh, at the most you would have an intelligent HVAC, but buildings of today are changing drastically. We are talking to customers um, and, and we see all these subsystems deployed in the building, they are getting very, very advanced. You can see your badging systems, security cameras, sensors, lighting, uh, fire alarm systems, everything is getting onto the network. The problem is all of these systems work in silos. Uh, if you had a lighting system, it would have its own control network, it would have its own power network. If you are uh, if you're looking at HVAC, it would have its own power network, its own control network, but they don't essentially talk to each other. Now, if you were to make the buildings efficient and smart, it's really important that all these subsystems talk to each other. So, for example, the, one of the main drivers that we see that people are moving to more efficient buildings, more digitized buildings, is primarily the efficiency and the customer experiences that they can enable. Imagine a building where uh, where the occupancy sensors talk to the HVAC or the lights or uh, or any other subsystems in the building, and you could enable scenarios like uh, let's say the room right next to us, nobody's sitting in there. The occupancy sensors can talk to the network, tell the network controller, "Hey, this room is empty." The network controller then talks to the HVAC and say, "Hey, there's nobody in the room. Just turn on turn off the HVAC." Right, so so things like that can really make the building efficient. Um, some other customer experiences uh, that we have seen is um, a lot of customers um, are using uh, use cases like uh, if, if there's a fire hazard in a certain part of the building, they are using lights connected to the network to drive the occupants away from the fire hazard. Um, a lot of customers in the education industry uh, are using lights to create a circadian rhythm so that they could keep the students engaged for longer period of time in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, one of the very interesting use cases that I wanted to bring up uh, is, uh, is from the hospitality industry. One of our customers uh, uh, from the uh, hotel uh, industry, what they did was they took everything that they could see in a hotel room and got it into the network, right from the lights, uh, the window blind motors, uh, the electric uh, mirrors, uh, POE TVs, uh, POE powered uh, mini fridge, etc. So the moment I walk into the room, I set everything up to my liking. The window shades, the light temperature, uh, the TV channels I like to see, and everything gets saved onto my profile. The next time I walk into that same hotel chain, doesn't matter which country I'm going into, which hotel I'm going into, uh, as soon as I enter the room, the same set of presets that I set earlier gets applied to my profile and the room is set to my liking. So, once you make the building smarter, uh, the, uh, the use cases that you can enable as far as efficiency and customer experience is con concerned are endless. So, and, and that's where Cisco comes into picture. Uh, the vision uh, we have is uh, to get everything of these subsystems converged onto one IP network so that they talk to each other and make the buildings more efficient, more smart, so that there's less human intervention and the building is kind of automated and runs on its own. However, uh, there's a challenge with it. We all know digitizing is important. We all know that once a building is planned, uh, it's going to be there for the next 30, 40 years and the building has to be ready for all the business intents, all the business outcomes uh, that the customer, the building occupants are looking for. But when you, when, you, when you try to get all these endpoints on the buildings, onto the network, they, you inherently uh, increase the attack surface. All these endpoints, uh, there's a race to make these cheap and possibly they might not have the greatest, the latest software stack on them. So it's the network's responsibility to provide a layered security approach so that the endpoints are protected from cybersecurity attacks um, or whatever attacks that are coming into the network. Uh, and if in case an endpoint is compromised, uh, the network is contained and the endpoint is quarantined. So the security uh, at Cisco will focus uh, to a great deal. It's really, really important. And uh, we, we all have seen all these kind of attacks. A university attack uh, by a vending machine. Uh, a smart bird carrying out a DDoS attack, right? 
And, and that's where solutions like uh, SDN, software defined networks, come into play. Um, we believe uh, making buildings smarter, making buildings efficient is possible. It's just that the consumers uh, need to gain, get an easier way to do it. They, they need to uh, get an automated way to do it, right? Uh, so the solutions like SDN, uh, we call it uh, Software Defined Access at Cisco, they focus on three major things, uh, segmentation, uh, automation, and assurance. Now what is segmentation? Uh, segmentation in the sense that you create small segments into the network of users or, or things, and you get give them access only to the things that they need access to. For example, if I'm walking into a Stanford facility today, um, I'm getting onto the guest network. I have no business talking to the vending machine or talking to the light. Similarly, if, if I have a light in a building, it doesn't move. It just stays there. It has no business talking to my uh, employee database or talking to my um, healthcare records and so forth. So it's really important that those segments are well defined and the IoT endpoints that we bring onto the network are constrained to talking into those uh, segments unless you specify otherwise. Right? Um, the other important part is uh, automation. We all know segmentation is important. We all know uh, digitization is important, but there has to be a way where where a building manager uh, specifies his intents, and that is converted into everything that the network needs to do. So, if I specify an intent saying Jeff comes in uh, and he should be only talk to the guest network, like uh, a light should only talk to a light and not an HVAC sensor, I should be able to define it on a controller in plain English and the controller should be able to automate it and take care of all the components that needs to uh, drive it from CLI level or uh, or make that happen from a policy level, right? And finally, uh, the, the third important piece is assurance. Um, as far as cybersecurity is concerned, uh, it's, it's really important that there is visibility uh, into what's going on into your network because you can protect your network uh, from the things that only you can see. Uh, if, if the network visibility is not there, uh, the network attacks might uh, be proliferating in your networks and you might not even know. So uh, it's really important that the, the endpoints are sending constantly uh, data and the controller is taking this data, making sense of it and telling you proactively what the problem might be so that you can take steps to, to prevent it instead of make, uh, doing the damage control after the network, is already, the network attack has already so, so those are the things we focus um, at Cisco, and I think that's a perfect segue uh, to check the session. We're going to talk more about cybersecurity and that segmentation this case. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Ravi. Good morning. Good morning. I teach a graduate uh, course of computer engineering at Santa Clara University. I fit it in Fridays from 7 to 9 p.m. And so my students are used to getting some compressed material. So indulge me for 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a lot of information. And uh, I'll give you a link where uh, I've got a video and I've talked about this stuff in more detail. This is one of the SRI smart buildings, uh, that's our DC office. Uh, SRI International. Um, Grew up out of Stanford over 70 years ago. We're based here in Menlo Park and throughout the U.S. So our mission, um, interesting, aligns with the core concept of what a smart building is all about, right? We want a safe environment that can help us be more productive. If I start talking about cybersecurity principles without first looking at the overall business objective, the overall organizational objective about why we use this technology, then I'm just sort of infatuated with something that's not going to add much value. So I never start with the tech, and I don't start with the security principle. I start with the goal. We're under attack. We talk about this stuff on the news. I think we're being desensitized to it. Um, we could shut the lights out again and make that point. Uh, by the way, our friends in Eastern Europe can do those things right now and uh, search uh, Dragonfly, uh, our critical infrastructure and power grid are already infiltrated. We're at risk. So we're in a state of war. Um, we can talk about this stuff calmly until something goes wrong. When something goes wrong, it's hard to 
describe the level of emotion and the fog of war and confusion and frustration when these attacks have devastating consequences. I didn't worry about the motivation of attackers as much before. Because I said, you need to control the system, you put these types of network segmentations in place, it's all principle-based. But there's so much to do and there's so much to protect in these complex systems that understanding the adversary's motivation is now becoming more important in prioritizing how we protect these complex systems. So, recent news from Russia. Yes, they're interested, right? There's a geopolitical component to my job uh, and the chief security officer role. My job is to help the organization make more informed decisions about risk. I'd rather not take the full burden of that on my own. So, we have breaches at Target, at Equifax. The board now wants to know my opinion, and I can help guide to keep the business in operation to satisfy the interests of stakeholders. But there's management philosophy that gets applied now. So, in the news this week, Equifax is redesigning their security organization to align the cybersecurity and physical security, the cyber-physical converged environment under one group of leadership. Because safety has now become our sphere of concern as well. So, how do we help folks make these informed decisions? Right? We ask a series of questions in the context of some type of a methodology. And we use that to assess risk. Right? So, thinking about a Cisco IoT device or Honeywell or whatever else, um, I don't think about just the device, I do think about its capability, but I think about how that's going to fit into a broader system and a system security plan and a long-term management and maintenance plan for all of these devices. And not just where it fits from a network standpoint, but the data it generates, how it uses that, privacy concerns, and on and on. This stuff gets kind of confusing and it gets big quickly, and that's why we need these methodologies and structured frameworks to think about the risk. Here's the money slide, right? So this is what I really focused on as sort of a takeaway for folks thinking about um, how do we try to solve some of these problems. A lot of these principles are not new. I like simplicity. I like things I can understand. And so I've seen a lot of different security tools and approaches and devices. And what I'm looking for is something that I can apply these control models to that makes sense. But now, the first time I talked about having security at a conference, I said, I don't think I'm an expert, but I realized nobody can be an expert, because it's everything, it's every protocol. So we start with some type of an architectural framework, and we apply those value principles. And then we think about domains of trust, trusted zones, at a network level, how data can be segmented, who has access to it, and we take the traditional IT management approach, that involves patching systems and trying to maintain things which we're already struggling with, and operational technology, sensors, and stuff that's even harder to patch. And at least we should separate those groups of risk. So because we intertwine them, then there could be lateral attack movement from your compromised HVAC system into a database, for example. So when we do that, we think about what's the criticality, what's the sensitivity of the information that we're dealing with, uh, where are things located, and can we architect some of these devices and edge compute closer to the area where it needs to operate, and thereby it's simpler and more isolated. It doesn't seem like it's cheaper, but it is cheaper, because if you build systems that can't be controlled well, then I might not have input when you do, but then when something goes wrong, I will do my darndest to rip it out and find something that's better, and that costs the organization more. I want to explain this slide. I need to talk to someone designing a system that can understand this type of a slide, right? Because if you can tell me what system you're building, I can figure out where it can be attacked, I can do a surface uh, analysis, I can do a threat model, and I can then have an intelligent conversation about where to manage risk and apply security controls. So my prerequisite to protecting this stuff is putting it into some type of a context like this. I gave a talk it was popular, so I did a repeat performance uh, the last month and then a, a couple of weeks ago at two big conferences um, where I was just trying to take these ideas and merge them together. So this is on YouTube. You can just 
this for Flavin and Octane, both with K's, uh, and you can see the full hour-long session. They like this presentation because it takes philosophy, and if you're hiring security leadership, you're paying for philosophy, right? It's sort of an art of warfare approach. Take that, combine it with the blue team, right, the defender's responsibilities of architecting a system, of planning things systematically and deploying them, right? And now taking the adversary, the red team's approach, and Lockheed Martin developed a very nice model because we don't just get attacked. That happens systematically. There's steps. Let's take the way the attacker thinks and infuse it in how we design and build systems. We want to break this chain as early as possible. This chain of doing reconnaissance, of then weaponizing, getting a foothold, and then exploiting and exfiltrating data. But as soon as we can break that chain, we have an advantage. So I won't cover all of this, but this is just one example. Through each stage of project planning, including IoT devices, smart buildings, everything else is going to connect you, then we can think about how do we counter reconnaissance, how do we counter we weaponization, and all the way to eventually trying to stop this exploitation from happening. I know I'm going fast, but at least this resource is available afterwards. So uh, that's enough of admiring the problem, right? SRI is about building solutions. We have a great legacy of doing that. And um, we have a Internet of Things Security and Privacy Center. Uh, we do interesting research. We just won the DARPA contract for the Internet of Battlefield Things. And so we love taking this knowledge, this leading-edge government-funded research, and then applying it back to commercial applications, other state, local, you know, international government applications. We develop technology to understand what the environment is. So here's the paradigm shift, but right? you can try to block these things down more. But you see this next wave of venture capital is going into trying to characterize data traffic and know, understand what's normal and um, intervene from that standpoint. A good example is hospitals. So if a system can help me get this picture if a system can look at network traffic and say, here's the radiology department, here's building management, here's how they should talk, here's how they shouldn't talk, then I can start to identify where attacks can happen. That's where tools, I think, can make the, the problem a little bit easier. So here's sort of SRI's approach. We tend to start in the middle or on the right, right, you know, building biometrics into Samsung's latest mobile devices, etc. What I'm spending more time on is how can we get innovation-driven companies uh, you know, access to this advanced research and applying these techniques into their strategies. If anyone's interested in that, I'm glad to talk extensively afterwards. The um, AI understandability may be the most important thing on this slide. Um, so I'll get on my soapbox for a minute. If you are a user, an investor, an engineer that is building or condoning building black box AI solutions, where you've got machine learning coming to conclusions and making decisions and recommendations that cannot be explained, shame. Don't support it. Don't use it. Don't rely on it. It's going to create a level of risk that I, worse than Russia coming at us every day. It's really the scariest thing we can imagine, and we're building it ourselves. But how do we counter that? We have to build AI systems that are understandable. So there's great research going on there. A lot of it is about having natural language interfaces to these tools. So this is the conclusion, now how do we make that explainable? I've heard folks say, well, Alexa already has all of our information. Why are we even trying? No, if, if you're ready to give up, if you don't want to hear the bad news and deal with it, you really shouldn't be in a security leadership role. We have to tackle these things consistently. So our IoT security lab, has a lot of good resources, a lot of these are free, there's a membership group if you want to get uh, more information about what we're doing. Um, I have a set form you can sign up for. Uh, and this is probably one other interesting area, right? So a smart building is part of a smart city, which is part of a smart, uh, you know, power grid. And our power grid is under attack. And so we're doing research for DARPA here as well. Um, we don't have a good answer to the question, what if our entire power grid gets shut down? Can we just flip the switch back on? We can do that with our laptop here. We can find the power switch, and et cetera. But, um, so the research here, I think, is going to be foundationally important for everything we're building on top of. 
Here's a few more resources. Um, I'll give you one other homework assignment. I guess is the open professor here. Um, for my students, the first assignment is to do some reconnaissance, figure out, uh, you know, in, in their organization, who their security leadership is, what can be targeted. As an individual, I'd recommend you all create a list of all the digital assets you use to manage your lives. And I've never had a student with less than 30 accounts they have to keep track of. We probably have, on average, 200. And so make a list, figure out how you rely on those things, figure out what your contingency is. If you can't do that in your personal life, how can we manage systems that are more resilient? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So maybe I'll tee up a, a few questions, and then uh, hopefully we can preserve a little bit of time to have the audience uh, questions and answers as well. Um, you know, I think the panelists all addressed uh, many aspects of IoT. Uh, Peter's question with regard to oversizing and, and Aaron's point about really uh, making sure we don't waste energy in its current state. And so the promise of IoT may be optimization or incremental optimization, but you, you have to do the fundamentals. Don't have oversized equipment, operate it, make sure it's operating to its original design or design intent. Um, and then there's always the dilemma of you design for something, but the building is being used for some other occupancy. And then you got to address those kinds of issues. Um, so you, you, you solve for the, the simplest thing and assume that's the case so you don't have wasted energy. How do you see incremental energy efficiency? And uh, I think Aaron's slide, the EIA slide, just sort of shown the distribution of lighting in HVAC. Um, in current state, I'd say the lighting industry is a little bit more mature all of the providers out there can have lighting systems that operate over power over Ethernet. And with that, it enables a connectivity to a device that then is already enabled with sensors. And the sensors typically are light level sensors, motion sensors, temperature sensors. So a lighting system offers a, an array of sensors that are essentially funded through a lighting upgrade. And which I also then say the question really probably to Aaron and, and Ravi in this case is, how do you then build the business case to go forward and do lighting upgrades in, in a typical building environment? You've got a lot of uh, long-term depreciation. This lighting system in this building on a gap allowed depreciation is typically 30 years, and this building seems to be about 10 years old. 20% so of the installed cost is already sunk and needs to be overcome on your return on investment analysis. So, you know, uh, I pose that question to building the business case through enhanced lighting and, and what is that return on investment that allows companies to move forward with IoT type lighting upgrades? <laughs> So, yeah, Robbie, I don't, have a question for you. I don't think it's stab at it. So, <clears throat> the way we look at it as uh, it's so if you, if you look at the greenfield deployments for traditional AC lighting versus uh, this is a way which is overfueled uh, lighting, it's it's definitely you know, we have studies and this going on it. But if we if you were to look at a retrofit, a heat retrofit, uh, one thing to understand here is the value or the Efficiency or the saving, the cost savings is just not from the lighting itself, the solution itself, but the value it brings to the use cases that would enable, that would be enabled to that. Like, so if you put in a light, uh, as you mentioned, an occupancy sensor, some of the temperature sensor component, right? That would enable some other use cases that would help organizations and building managers save money on other, other things. Like if, if you detect that there's no, there's a certain part of the building that is not used by anybody for months, Stop selling the clean heat, right? And that's cost saving right there. And that's that's making the building efficient. Your process is more efficient. So, so we we attack it from both angles, not just uh, the cost, the apex, uh, the profit of the capex perspective, but also the use cases that help you save money from, from, the, from the things that. Great. Yeah. Just yeah. Quick. So the the way to fast track that through some type of a security approval or review is if you can identify those other use cases proactively. Yeah. If you yeah. say, you know, we can do these other things and we'll figure it out later, 
okay, we want to have an architecture that can support that. But the more I know how you're going to use these devices and what the information is and where it's going, and I actually can draw a picture of it, it doesn't even have to be pretty. I, you know, just a whiteboard picture. I can, you know, stick a snap of it. I understand where that stuff's going and how to be attacked. Then that's sort of a fast track to, yeah, this makes sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah and, and I think you guys already addressed that, uh, you know, segmentation. So we would have a lighting system. We've done one in a building uh, just down the street in Sunnyvale where we upgraded the lighting in a retrofit application. We're able to address lighting because we basically repurposed the space from office to some other specialized uses. But we did um, recognize that the endpoint is a light and therefore the segmentation was on a real estate VLAN and did not ride on the the trusted endpoint of the corporate network, but it was in a, a subnet on a VLAN that had a certain level of privileges. And I think that would suffice the, the uh, security concerns that guys like Jeff would have because you're now provisioning the power and collecting the data on a segment of the network that only needs to have the privileges that it's required to run lighting. Um, you know, looking at the sort of the value proposition, you, you have a, a, a lighting, you have a, a rich array of sensors now gathering temperature data, occupancy data, and light level data. And the light level data will optimize the lighting levels within the room and you have presets to that. But I, I, I really think as a real estate professional, the use of occupancy data it is sort of unexplored and potentially a, a significant return on investment. Uh, and so people that care about it too. That's the interesting thing. And it right. gets to sort of Peter's comment about the silos, you know, within the organization. We're having this conversation right now. And it's it's not it's space planning people that want the occupancy data yeah. and for them it's the holy grail. Right. But but it's the it's the sort of facility operations people that are making this energy case to retrofit light fixtures. Uh, you know, and that's particularly obvious with occupancy data, but it, there's other IoT sources where that matters too. I mean, and so I think increasingly you need someone or a group of people that can start to have these conversations about building technology above and beyond just the construction process. Yes. Absolutely. And, and just to go, uh, let me just close on a point here. So let's say you have occupancy data and the consulting engineers in the room and Peter and Aaron, you can address this. We in typical design have a minimum airflow. If you had occupancy data and nobody's in the room, you need minimum airflow. And you, you have an ASHRAE requirement for that, but the argument could be made that you have to condition unoccupied spaces. And, and that's sort of like low-hanging fruit just by having occupancy data that typically is not available in this conventional design, you've got a thermostat on the wall operating, it's most likely a, a, a variable air volume damper delivering air to the space, but it's not detecting whether anybody is in the space. It detects temperature from radiant heat. But once you have occupancy data, then you, you have the ability to optimize and, and perhaps challenge the conventional approach of delivering a minimum air set point to delivering no air where air is not needed. So there's these other, I think, business cases available to us when we start looking at the converged sensor data to optimize HVAC. The temperature data, if every one of these lights had a sensor on it giving you temperature readings, you have a much richer array of sensor data than that one sensor on the wall. And perhaps that one sensor on the wall is no longer needed, and therefore you can rely on lighting sensors to modulate HVAC. So as a person responsible for developing NetApp strategy for Internet of Things in the built environment, you know, we're, we're continuously challenged with how do you build the business case to sell it to management. And, and don't know if Cisco or Aaron, you've got other ideas in that particular area since you're already embarking upon it with Google. You know, how do we enhance the, the value proposition? There, any program I've worked on, I have a slide I didn't include, it has five, roughly five value drivers, five or six. You know, and the, the, and they, so some of them are easily measurable and some of them are, are less measurable. So the easiest to measure is, is reduced operating costs. That's typically through repair and maintenance and utilities. Um, 
The next, which would be the most important at Google, but that's somewhat unusual, is occupant comfort. Um, some becoming more easily measured, but you have to have really clean data in a central spot so you can index spaces and normalize. Um, you can measure it through things like hot and cold calls too, but it's somewhat more fungible what the value is. You need an organization that actually just cares about that. Um, moving towards more predictive maintenance and reducing time to response and maximizing asset life and then optimi optimizing your total space portfolio, which is really where you know, occupancy comes in. Um, that's sort of your set of benefits in the cost-benefit analysis that you have to pick from. And some of those you got to make assumptions on, and some of them are pretty clear, you know, to, to set targets uh, around energy. So that's where I'd say to start, just to think of it within that framework. Um, you know, the cost side, a little bit easier to come up with if you've got some, you know, some skill sets or some experience in your staff and people that have done this. Okay. Now, let's go to the audience real quick. You Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and this area, so we're calling out the topic. A lot of times we're doing it is more like occupants satisfaction, general engagement with the building. But that for that kind of things like status, general sense of the building itself, and breaking all the tariff members. And it's surprising when you can detach people from an ROI number. Which is the real estate industry corporate says you are a little but the only number is just a big song. So one or two year payback at worst two years or about it. Right. Um, and uh, so you have to pat them from that number because there's not a lot of projects in the corporate paybacks. And they do that to give them uh, think about the emotional value to future tenants that you can still be sensitive to the mm -hmm. Excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> That'll motivate the property owners. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and the convergence allows for that. Yeah. Yes, I have two questions. The first one has to do with how close the uh, building office and the operations uh, work with the sustainability which is generally the only higher level um, goal based uh, perspective. Well, let me take the first one and let the panel. Um, organizationally, what's very effective is to have the environmental sustainability team report into the real estate workplace resources. So that's our structure. I'm responsible for environmental sustainability. Those are everyday conversations that data moves back and forth and in, in, in perfect alignment. And then the reporting into our broader corporate social responsibility, my teammates on that already know all of the programs that the facilities ops teams have or design and construction is considering. So that's one real simple way. It's just organizationally structured so that the environmental sustainability folks are actually embedded into the real estate folks in those conversations. We 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 are stating those kinds of goals, and, and we've had a remarkable energy reduction performance, but not so much from office environments. So when you look at well, what is your real estate, the lab, data center side, we've made some significant reductions, but not so much in the office space. But yeah, we we can't state those goals. 
uh, through a variety, mostly internal. We do some external reporting, but it's um, it's really just uh, readouts to executive management and through our own communication, internal newsletters, and uh, and then reports we actually publish, like CDP and a couple other platforms we report into. Yeah, but I'd say the database um, is not necessarily shared. It's through the team that records data into the database, which shared is typical, you know, communication through SharePoint or internet sites uh, internally. The, the second question also, um, you know, is a, a challenge, and I don't know if the panel wants to challenge, take that one on. What was it again? Sorry. I was thinking about that one. Yeah. What was the second? Well, you can put me down, but the second one is about, you know, how many states Oh, portfolio mix. Yeah. yeah. Look, it, it's a huge challenge, right? And, and so, um, if you look at a, a company like um, uh, what Google's done, um, they do lease a lot of space. You have to, because you, you're a big company, you're growing. Um, but they do very strongly enforce the requirement to have uh, at least some of the key data sources for IoT um, built in, so uh, to their standards. So, so you know, for example, keeping a consistent building automation system across a large geographic portfolio. So there are things you can build into the lease as a tenant. Obviously, the bigger you are, the more power you command as a tenant. The the, the rates you're paying, you're going to have more control over that. But you can definitely enforce standards. So, you know, things like building automation systems, and whether or not you get them with an open protocol or, or not, like the. Those things don't really add cost into the TI process, and you can just tell landlords. But I mean, that, that, that is a significant challenge, particularly in commercial real estate portfolios, because they, you know, all the properties are acquired. The vast majority of the properties in most commercial real estate portfolios are acquired. And so you have every manner of edge device type technology, and the ability to actually go through and invest to upgrade, um, you know, your fleet of digital infrastructure is a, it's a massive challenge. And, and I'd say the biggest challenge I see is not so much figuring out what, what needs to be done. It's the skill sets, either at the corporate level or individual property teams, to know that they even need to upgrade something like a building automation system or how to put in a consistent metering network. It's just, there's just nobody thinking about that at the portfolio level. It's a little bit better at the corporate side because, you know, things like standards can be built in around design. That's yeah. fairly common. We want our offices to feel consistent and therefore the engineering types like us yeah. can get in our, you know, standards on infrastructure. But um, look at, it needs to be handled at a portfolio level and you need people that actually understand beyond what you see. The biggest problem I have is that lots of this stuff is hidden and even the people that are used to the air conditioning part of it don't know enough about the control side of it. Your, your design engineers probably don't know enough about building automation. Some do, a few, but most don't. Um, and so m requiring that people sort of having somebody just be their job and pulling in those skill sets is what's going to fix the problem on that. Yeah. You know, I often find that you really need your IT staff to bring in this community and the office to get the training to work with the real estate team. Not only the training that has to be It'll make your project go faster with a better outcome. In most cases, yeah. And actually, that's a great segue to Jeff. If you don't mind just putting your IT hat on, you go into the unknown. We don't even know if we're going to have the landlord build a, a suite or we get to do it internally. But, you know, how, how do you develop enough flexibility from an IT perspective to enable some IoT if that becomes an opportunity through that lease negotiation because typical IT shops have their set of standards which don't necessarily contemplate IoT but more connectivity for employees. I just want to start with the lay of the land. Give me something like that picture I showed, a simple version on a whiteboard. What are the components? What are the control planes to manage them? What are the options? Is there an opportunity to do network level segmentation? I didn't talk about micro segmentation, but if there's any virtualized systems involved, that's a whole other set of considerations. So you can apply these different types of controls. So I want to know what options I've got. Um, I want to know what type of communication can happen between these systems also. So I didn't really emphasize that, but 
um, we think things are isolated, but there's cyber physical connections where an infrared sensor on my operational technology network can communicate with the IT side of the house. So, you know, I want to do some type of assessment there. Um, it's like putting uh, brakes on a sports car, right? Those controls will let you uh, create a more high-performance environment. Okay. Okay. Any other questions out in the audience? How are we doing on time stuff? Go ahead, please. So, so, from my standpoint, a lease is a deal to get a service for a period of time. All deals are negotiable, and it's better to write down the terms of the deal. So, um, now, what, interesting thing I've seen, we have a we have an office that's located in a Federal Reserve building. Their physical security, even IoT level stuff, is quite impressive. <laughs> Just because it's there doesn't mean it's there for our interests, right? So, these control systems that might create an illusion of security control, um, if it's not... If there's no contractual obligation, right, to manage these things in a certain way um, or to make sure that there's consistency, um, I won't rely upon them in my system security plan. That's the first fatal flaw that folks might make is they, you know, everyone leads with this impressive, we've got something encrypted or transport layer security. So how does it apply and what's the commitment? And so having a service level agreement, um, and so if it's a separate contract, I've seen that, um, then you've got different options there. But the first thing is to write it down. And as soon as folks don't want to write something down and commit to it, you know that it's not a control that you can rely on. I actually deal a lot with leases. And, um, and from a boilerplate, you don't see it, but we do, you know, we did a long lease up in Boulder and we put in those provisions. It, conventionally, a house system is landlords and they deliver air to us, but we demanded in our lease to have access to their systems. We don't have control, but we at least have read only. So I, I think you'll start seeing more and more, uh, at least engaged tenants, start requesting uh, provisions to certain systems that the landlord in typical leases is exclusive domain of the landlord. Yeah, my intuition is that there's not nearly enough stuff in leases related to what you're getting from landlords. It's been a long time since I've reviewed one, and they were mostly in New York, and they, when I was a consulting engineer, and they're pretty pretty slim on what you're actually getting. Uh, I suspect that's going to change, particularly with space and service type models and people's expectations coming up about what they're actually getting. I think that will get a lot more, I hope it'll get a lot more interesting. Yeah, but I think landlords, if you know, companies have green leasing policies, they, they're readily willing to disclose what their building performance are because it may get a, a dollar or two square foot more because a lead certification or a high performance building. So there, there are cases where the landlord's more than willing. The state of California has a lot. If we were to sell a building, we've got to disclose its uh, energy efficiency and actually provide supporting data for it. So um, 
it's not required in leases, but I, I would think that tenants would uh, inquire on that, at least a uh, you know, savvy tenant. Are we out of time? All right, one last question and we'll get out of here. Yep. Uh, there's probably two, two aspects of that. One is that the mid and smaller organizations are part of an ecosystem. And now that we know that we've got these connections and data flowing between environments and you're managing my whatever, then um, I'm relying on you to have a certain level of control. So the larger organizations, I think, have a new set of responsibilities to at least be a guide or set requirements. If something's important, write it down. Tell these service providers what you need them to do, what standards to follow, what frameworks, and actually collect information and periodically monitor that this stuff is being controlled. And so if you're a small organization, how do you deal with all this complexity? You go and get help. You, you know, find service providers who might have you know, more advanced uh, security management aspects of what they're doing. Um, so it's important to start asking these questions. Uh, security is, a, is really just an aspect of quality, right? And once you can articulate what the quality is that you're expecting, then you have a, a fighting chance of getting it. Great. Yeah, thank you. So we hope this was a good use of your time, and please help me thank the, the presenters.